Yes, it is my great pleasure to um, give you Zainab Salvi. And um, happy Women's Day, although it's yesterday, but still happy Women's Day, Women's Month, all of it. Um, and in that spirit, in the spirit of Women's Day, I wanted to read this poem. What if I am not sadness? What if I am not grief? What if I am not my victim's story, nor am I my pain? What if they are all part of me, but not fully me? What if I am just me? What if I'm joy without reason, happiness in all seasons? What if I am love for all? What if I laugh for no reason and all reasons? What if they are all part of me? What if I don't hate my enemy? What if I forgive? What if I'm clear about my right and my wrong and still see me? What if my actions are not defined vis-a-vis -vis him or her? What if they are defined vis-a-vis -vis my truth? What if I'm fully free? How will I be? What if I see without judgment, love without reason? What if I give and receive without worry? What if I can be all and still be me? What if this is it? What if this is perfect? What if I don't doubt? What if I just believe? How would life be if I let it be? How would I be if I accept fully me? What would I be if today I am free? What if this is the new story? You know, it's, I think it's time that we tell a new story for women. A story that is beyond victimhood and is beyond martyrdom and is beyond anger and is a, a new story that is joy, joyful and forgiving and loving and upset and beautiful and, and like it's it's what if it's what if we tell a new story of we get ahead of the story and define a new one. Ironically, it is my journey that I thought I'm helping women survivors afford that led me to this position. I embarked upon uh, journeys of war and wa the warrior journey in, when I was 23 years old. I um, was a recent immigrant from Iraq. I uh, heard about the rape camps and concentration camps in Bosnia. It was 1993, I was like, well, you've got to do something. We can't just watch and we see rape camps and concentration camps in the midst of Europe, in the heart of Europe, and all of us look the other direction and say, tomorrow we'll do something. And that's how the journey starts. So I embarked upon going to war zones. At that time was Bosnia. And since then it became Kosovo and Afghanistan and Rwanda and Iraq and Nigeria and Southern Sudan, and it was in Congo that I learned after many years of doing the work of you know, matching women and helping them and giving them training program and this program and telling them to speak their truth and to break their silence, but it was in Congo. That I learned to change, to own my story. I was in front of a woman, uh, Nanbitu is her name, She's 52 years old at that time. And she sat in front of me and she was telling me about how she was raped. Her, 20, her nine year old daughter, her 21, 22 year old daughters were all raped by so many men, they did not know how many. Sorry. I don't know what to do. I don't have a watch, so my phone is my watch, but no. Um, so Nabitu was telling me all of her story. And she was telling me how she was raped, how her sons were forced to spread their mother's ne uh, legs uh, apart, how one of them was asked to rape his mother, and when he refused, he was shot in the foot. She's telling me how her nine-year-old was raped, how they pillaged everything, how they burned everything just before they left. 
And she looked at me and she said, I've never told the story to anybody but you. So I look at her back and I said, well, I'm a storyteller. Would you like me to share the story to others in the world? Because frankly, that's how I raise awareness and raise money. Or would you like me to keep this story a secret? So she looks at me and she says, if I can tell the whole world about my story, I wait. But I can't. You can. You go ahead and tell the world, just not to the neighbors. <laughs> a year later, she was on the Oprah Winfrey show, and the neighbors knew about her story, and she moved from a victim who's like embarrassed of her story to the neighbors greeting her like a leader. Um, but it was that moment that was the most humbling moment in my life, is I went down in my spirit as low as possible. I cried for five hours after she told me this. I was in a car from Congo to Rwanda, and I just cried the whole time. Because I realized that this illiterate, homeless woman, who the dress she had on, someone gave her, the shoes she was wearing, she made out of garbage. That woman in Congo that I think that I am helping has more courage than I do and has more connections and consciousness, consciousness between her story and other women's story. If the whole, if I can tell the whole world about my story so other women would not have to go through what I've gone through, I wait. But I can't. You go ahead and tell the world, just not the neighbors. That's what she said. She has more connection that if I tell my truth and if I speak my truth, then I may be, may be part of stopping the vicious cycle that women are stuck in. The cycle of violence. So it was the most humbling moment in my life. And that's when I realized I cannot do the journey of helping other women if I don't start the journey here. I can't help those other women in this other part of the world, in Africa, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, if I don't actually meet them as a woman, not as a savior, and not meet them as a victim, is meet them one woman to one woman. I need to own my story, and that was really the beginning of my journey. So, here it is. I, was, I grew up in war, in the Iran-Iraq war. At a very young age, 11 years old, I realized that what people see of war is only what my, the men were doing, fighting in the front line. And no one was seeing what I was seeing of war as a child, where I was noticing it was my mother who was keeping life going. It was my mother who was keeping us who, you know, happy and dressed and going to school and feeding us and in the middle of a siren playing a puppet show so she would not say, or in the middle of a raid, playing a puppet show for my brothers and I so we would not be scared. My father was not with us, to be honest, for the first, you know, six months of the war and then the last eight years of the war, he was in and out. And I realized at a very young age that it was my mother who actually, it was women who kept life going in the backline discussion of war. But the world only paid attention to the frontline discussion of war. And if we are to really understand peace, and to really understand how to stop war, we've got to understand it as much from the frontline discussion as we do from a backline discussion. Well, there is no way we can actually create sustainable peace if we do not hear what women have to say about it. I grew up also knowing Saddam Hussein. I called him uncle. My father was his pilot. Um, I, uh, we, we were his friends. And an experience with, you know, it was a life experience, actually, that I did not recognize. It's such a, today, I am thankful for it. For 20 years, I went to therapy for it. 
<laughs> but today, I am thankful as I was able to tell my new story. Now I'm doing work with Libyan women and with other women, and when I hear their fear about other dictators, Gaddafi and all of that, I was like, I know exactly what they mean. And I'm so grateful I experienced that fear because now I actually connect with other people who have been through that. So today I'm grateful for it. But the devil is a fallen angel and he was a poison gas into our home. Just like a fog of fear we lived in. Fear was always there. Imagine living always in fog and that fog is fear. And that's how I grew up. But the last one, I grew up with a mother who was a very strong woman in the midst of that fear. She would shake me and she said, you've got to be strong. You've got to be independent. No man should expect you to know how to cook or clean just because you're a woman. And actually, my partner would testify that this is true. I'm, my mother just forgot. <laughs> not forgot. She was intentional not to teach me. So I'm pretty bad in these things. But, you know, um, there's another story, another book I'm writing about. Well, she didn't tell me there's actually someone else is doing the cooking and cleaning. <laughs> And that's another story. Um, but she was like, you've got to be strong. But within this atmosphere of fear, war, or love of a mother, I was sent to America in an arranged marriage, which is very, you know, was confusing for me. How could this mother of mine that I love so much and trusted so much do this to me? I was raped, I was violated, I was abused. I had to leave him after three months. I found myself with $400 in America in the midst of uh, the first Gulf War. Iraq had invaded Kuwait and I find myself alone in a strange country. And that's how I started my journey. I was embarrassed for the longest time up until six years ago to say I was raped. I was embarrassed to say I was in an abusive marriage. I was, it was like, how could I say I'm a feminist and I'm a strong woman and acknowledge this, that I was actually an abused woman before? I was embarrassed to acknowledge my vulnerability and my weaknesses. And yet, what Nambitu taught me is that I cannot go and advocate for other women to tell their stories if I don't own mine first. So while I was embarrassed to tell the world what I just told you, I went to Bosnia and to Kosovo and to Rwanda and to all these countries working with women survivors of wars, telling them you've got to speak up, you've got to break your silence, creating women's centers for them, safe haven for women where they can come and meet and learn about their rights and learn vocational and business skills so they can get jobs. But create a support network for women, create a sponsorship where we ask women from all over the world to sponsor one woman at a time by sending her 30 pounds a month and exchanging pictures and letters with her. So here I am advocating for the whole world to take ownership of their story, but not me. And I came when I start owning my story. And what I just told you, I actually end up writing a memoir of it. And my therapy was actually telling my truth. You know, so I really, really believe unless we tell the truth, there can be no healing. And when it comes to women, we often don't tell our truth because we are embarrassed of it. Shame, honor. Uh, most women, ironically, are afraid to hurt their father if they tell their truth. If they are afraid to hurt their family, their boss, their whatever. And I don't think all the stories had to do about rape or violence. I think some of them have to do with discrimination, with not getting paid equally, with sexual harassment, with feeling ridiculed in the office because you're a woman. There are so many stories. Please, you know, between now and then, I guess someone who says, oh, you're so lucky you have a bad story. I just don't have one. I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I mean, it's like this is you get envied for being raped? Like, no. That's not, the story is not the dramatic story. The story is everyone's personal story. It has its own merits. It has its own truth because it's yours. But we have been stuck. We are told to be silent for way too long. And unless we break it, as Nanbitu have taught me to, we are part of the vicious cycle. When I wrote my memoir and told my story, I realized I had been owning my fear. I had become the owner, the champion of my fear. 
and kept the story going because I was so afraid. What would happen if I break the story and said, jump off the cliff? Where would I land? Would people love me or hate me or kill me or do whatever? What would I land? But if you tell it from your truth and the integrity of your truth, then any truth is the first step for healing. So that's how I started women. That's the part, the part of the journey of Women for Women International. And then, 18 years later, I decided that it is time for me to start a new journey. 18 years later, and the Arab Spring and the Arab Revolutions, which was a magnificent change to witness, magnificent, no matter what's going on right now in the Arab world, the chaos that you're all seeing, that change, that people rebelling in the streets and overcoming their fear and saying to their dictators, leave, I still have goosebumps just thinking of it. And it is because of that I decided to actually step down as the CEO of Women for Women after growing up the organization from only serving 30 women to 300,000 women 18 years later, and from having zero amount of money to sending $100 million to women survivors of wars. <clears throat> the story, the story for me, the merit about this, is that if I can do it, an immigrant from Iraq of all countries, whose English is not a first language, who went through all this, anybody in the world can do it. Like, please don't give me the excuses like, oh, I cannot do it. Because if I could do it, you could do it. Believe me, right? I had zero advantages and privileges in America, zero. And so, but in the process of leaving, I wanted to understand what is the secret sauce? What is it that triggered the aid is the agent of change in women's lives? Is it the sponsorship program that I just told you about? Is it microfinance? Everyone talks about microfinance being the, the best program. Is it giving women access to education to learn about their rights and to read and write? Is it giving women vocational skills training? Is it giving girls a voice? What is it I really wanted to understand? What is the trigger, the agent of change that makes a woman who's been silent and quiet and in the corner of her life to speak up and all of us and stand up and claim her space? So I traveled to all the countries that I helped set up to do my farewell, but to also learn to get the summary of the lesson. And I was asking all these women, and finally one of my colleagues from Bosnia holds my hand and she says, Zainab, the secret sauce is not special magic program, it is inspiration. All what women want is inspiration. And it was the journey, and it is that journey that this book comes about. If you knew me, you would care. I wanted to understand what is it that changes women's lives. And, and in order to understand, I wanted to meet with them as a woman. And I wanted to know not only, uh, tell me, uh, how, when were you raped? Uh huh, absolutely, you know, and just show her as the victim. But I really, honestly, wanted to understand her dreams when she was a child. And I wanted to understand the love story. And I wanted to understand the beauty. And I wanted to understand all of these things. And thus, if you knew me, you would care. If you knew me, you would know that Caritas, for example, is a Rwandese woman who survived the genocide. And uh, in Rwanda, where in 1994, more than half a million were raped in 100 days, and more than a million people were killed in these 100 days. And she fell in love with another man who also survived the genocide. His wife was killed in the genocide. He has three children, and Caritas really fell in love with the children. And she wanted to, she agreed to marry him just so she can be with the children. She loved the children. Well, it eventually ended up that this man is abusive. 
and he would beat her, not in any physical way, not in any clear way. He would hold her from the front of her hair, and her, he beat her in the back by the wall. So the injury would be inside her head, and no one, no police can see it. There's no, um, no marks. And so she said, I thought that this is my destiny. Most women think that, that this is my destiny. I have no way out. I don't know what to do until she visited a neighbor. And that's the story of the inspiration, because the inspiration could come from visiting a neighbor, hearing gossip, radio, TV, a book, as to anything, a speech, I don't know, I hope so. Um, it, she visits the neighbor, and she says the neighbor had nice furniture in, and the clothes were really nice, and the children were all dressed very nicely, and they're going to school, and they looked happy. And there was a man in the house, but not any man, a man-man in the house, and like a really nice man who is married to the neighbor. So I said, she said, I took the neighbor to the side and said, how did you change your life? What happened? And she, the neighbor said, I learned how to make beads, paper beads, and I started making necklaces. And from the necklaces, I started selling them $10 a piece. And here I am, there are sofas in my, in my house, and then the nice man comes in, and the children are going to school, and I'm doing well. So Caritas make that as the lantern in her, it's like the flashlight, the candle in the darkness of her cave. And she keeps that idea in her head, and she starts looking for the organization who will teach her to make paper beads. And she finds women for women in the process and goes behind her husband's back. And she takes double the classes. She takes back-to-back -back classes so she learned the beats fast enough. And she starts learning how to read and write. And she starts making the necklaces and selling the necklaces. And she starts buying the nice clothes for her and the kids and for him. The furniture came. And one day he's like, what's going on? And she said, well, I'm making this money. And I, need, I know how to read and write. So... A lot of people ask me, how are the men uh, you know, react to empowering women? The men react well to empowering women, believe me. When the woman is making money and is helping the family and they're seeing their life standards improved, they, they, they're like, okay, okay. As one Iraqi man who was very poor, and I said, do you mind that we're working this with your uh, wife? And he says, we are so hungry and we are so tired. And if you're going to help our family through my wife, then be it. Just help us. And that's the truth. You know, when people ask me what do men feel, um, when you are so hungry and when you are so tired, it does not matter. Just help us. So her husband goes a full circle. I was like, how is he doing? And she says, well, we're negotiating the relationship right now. He's improved in, some, in a lot of aspects. There's few aspects that he still needs to improve. We're negotiating. He's also a flag in my spouse, you know, I need the man to say, so no one bothers me, you know, he's my flag, you know, so I, he's, he's doing good, well, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. That's Caritas, you see, she goes, she's not a victim today, she looks gorgeous if you see her picture. If you knew that, you know, what one woman in Congo, when I asked her, what does peace mean for you, she said, food. Or that my own Dalai Lama, what I consider my Dalai Lama, a woman, another Nambitu actually, who when I asked her, what is peace means for you? She said, peace is inside my heart. No one can give it to me. And no one can take it away from me. Now, I spend a lot of times going to yoga as much as possible and meditate as much as possible to find that peace inside my heart. And Nambitu, a few years ago, was imprisoned three months in a room, raped day in and day out. And she couldn't even go to the bathroom without having an escort. And that woman tells me, peace is inside my heart. And she tells me, that child I have out of rape is my prophet. She teaches me how to love. I call Nambitu my true Dalai Lama. You see, it's the most unfair thing to present Nambitu in a victim way. It violates her integrity. When I only, if I only tell you she's been raped for three months, 
because that woman have found peace that we are all looking for, all looking for living in a shack and raising three children because her husband abandoned her and raising the fourth who she got out of rape. And she says, Zaina, peace is inside my heart. If you see her picture, she is the most beautiful. There is light in her. If we knew who they are, we would know that they are us. She is me. I am her. That the connections between each one of us in this room is we are all part of it, part of the one. But if we separate and we say those other people, then we could not get to that peace that we are all aspiring for. You know, I heard the actual Dalai Lama say once that if you, want, if you don't respect the people you are serving, then better not respect them, better not serve them. If you don't respect those you are serving, then better not serve them. And I really like, it stayed with me so much because it got into the nuances of relationships between the giver and the receiver between the victim and the savior. It got into, there is a, a line of nuances. If there is no respect in that line, then there is no peace in that relationship. An Iraqi woman I interviewed talks about how her and her family and the women in her family were hungry for three weeks during the war, the first Gulf War. There was no food, she said. They had to eat the leftover of the flowers. You know, when they clean the flowers back home, we clean it, I don't know what you call it. So the bread is like a rock. And she said, three weeks later, my brother-in-law came from Kuwait with a stolen sack of uh, rice and a stolen sack of uh, flour. And she said, we knew it was stolen because it was written Kuwait on it and they are in Baghdad. She said, but we were so hungry. We baked the flour, you know, the, the bread, we cooked the rice, and we ate in silence. And she said, he refused to eat, he just stayed silent. Until we washed the dishes, tucked the children to bed, and he came and he says, I have to tell you, this is a stolen food. And I could have stolen, you know, gold and machines and things like that, but I knew you're hungry, and I'm so sorry I stole it, but I knew my family's hungry, so I stole food. You know, I have never been hungry in my life and I'm very grateful for that. But this woman, she told me, she said, you know, we were hungry and we knew stolen food is a sin, to steal is a sin. But we ate it because we had no other choice. We ate a stolen food. And it occurred to me, in that vulnerability, you do anything, anything, but the giver, and in this case, he stole the food. In this case, we give the food. We give our second-hand clothes. We distribute food to other parts of the world, to the poor in this neighborhood. And we think that this will show them how generous and kind we are. Not so. If we don't do it with respect, they feel it. The fact that a person is taking given food does not mean they think that you are actually giving it out of love and respect. Do you understand the difference? Because if you are vulnerable, you eat whatever is thrown from the helicopters or thrown from the garbage. But if we really, really, really want to make a difference in this world, we need to do, initiate that relationship between me and her from love and respect. Not taking advantage of her own vulnerability of being hungry. We need to understand her decisions and not make judgment of it because she is hungry. There is a difference on how we do charity and how do we reach out to each other. One African woman told me in Congo also, she said, please tell everyone here, do not come and save us. Save yourselves first. And when you are in that good position, then come and talk with us. You know, it is, and this is the truth in my case. 
I used to be a very melodramatic person, an angry militant in my 20s who refused to put makeup on or to wear nice clothes because I'm on the mission of saving the world. But it was in Rwanda that I learned how to dance and sing. And I was like, if these women who have survived hell, they saw bodies in the streets for months after the genocide, if they know how to, if they still sing and dance, who am I to take, it so, to take myself so seriously and refuse to sing and dance? And if women in Afghanistan, as we learned from this book, you know, I learned from the women of Afghans to pay attention to my eyebrows. <laughs> I'm serious, because it's always, not that mine is actually, you know, <laughs> but it's always clean. And it's the midst of the war, they clean, a married woman cleans her eyebrow, cleans her upper lips. I was interviewing some of the women for that book and I was like, can you actually fix mine? I'm so embarrassed but that I learned from women in Afghanistan the appreciation of beauty. I learned from the Bosnian women where I started my, child, my journey in to put red lipstick. Sorry, I'm not wearing one today, but you know, to put a red lipstick on because in the midst of war, when I was going to Sarajevo and I was like, what do you need me to bring you next time I come? And they said, lipstick. I was like, seriously? Like, I was like judgmental. How could you? Are you kidding me? Seriously? Lipstick? You need food. We need like... And they said, no, lipstick. We need to feel beautiful. And so when a sniper, before he shoots at us, he needs to know he is shooting on a beautiful woman. And it is from them from the very women that I thought are vulnerable, oh, poor people, that I learned a strong heart is a happy heart. A strong heart is not, you know, a dramatic house, oh, saving me like an angry one, the warrior one, the fighting one. A strong heart is a happy heart. Because with happiness and the embracing of beauty, as I swear to you, I learned from Afghanistan and from Bosnia and from, it is because of Bosnia that I start wearing high heels. And it is because of Congo that I start loving dancing. And it is because of Afghanistan that I start plugging my eyebrows. You know, it is, I learned that the change we aspire to do is not with the sword, it's not with anger but to embrace the beauty from within. And rather than fighting the enemy, we need to dance and dissolve it onto us. The change with beauty is so much more seductive and so much more calming. And rather than being angry at men, and I was angry at men, for they have committed a lot of the crimes in this world. But rather than be angry at them, I actually have compassion and love. Because that's the only way. We cannot ask the violence to stop if we are angry and we meet it with anger. We can only ask the violence to stop if we actually like, go at it with peace and with joy and with beauty. And if it doesn't, then you stay enough and you leave. When I say beauty and joy, it does not mean like, ah, you know, it does not mean an airhead. It means you put boundaries and your boundaries are not, you don't operate out of anger. You operate out of love. And it's not that I don't find myself angry sometimes, believe me. But now I stop. And I go and find my peace again and then come back and then respond because the only way to make the change is out of love and out of joy. It is from the women here that I learned how to forgive without being asked for forgiveness. And when I heard that, I was like, too much, too much, you cannot, what? Forgive without being asked for forgiveness, enough. No, 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 too much. And it is to forgive without always being asked for forgiveness. And I learned it from two women, but uh, two things, but one woman in this book, a Rwandese woman whose son and husband was killed. And she, when you look at her, she still looks bitter. 
And the killer came and found her and he says, I can't live with my life. I, can't, I need you to forgive me. And she said, first I reject it. And he kept on visiting and I was like, leave. And he kept on visiting, he said, leave. And she said, finally he was dying, he had cancer. And she said, I had to make a choice. I need to free myself from that anger. So she said, I learned, I decided to forgive him, to let it go. It is what it, you know. And so she forgave him. And if that woman can forgive the killer of her own son and her own husband, who are you not to forgive those who have hurt you? And it's not easy. Believe me, I struggle with it all the time. <laughs> but if she learns it, then I aspire to get there. If she got it, then I too maybe one day can get there. But we've got to start forgiving without being asked for forgiveness. It is time to tell a new story for us. And the new story has to start with owning your own journey, my own story. Because my best gift as an individual, as a woman, as, is my story. And if I believe in my story, but I'm not talking about me, Zainab, I'm talking about each one of you. It's in your telling your story that you become the flashlight or torchlight, I think in, in England, the candle to another woman's life. And it is because of your story that she can have a light in her cave and walk out of her cave. And when every woman owns her story and tell her story, then we eventually stop the vicious cycle that we have been stuck on for too long. It's 102 or 103 anniversary of International Women's Day. And we have accomplished a lot in the last hundred so years. But if this is a mountain, we are by far not at the top of the mountain. We are halfway in the mountain. There is a long way to go. We still need to change how media look at women and present women. We still need to, in my opinion, be represented fully in the corporate world because we can talk about change outside of the structure. We've got to also dominate the structure. We've got to have better representation in the government to influence what, how decisions are being made. We are still marginalized by far. Only 3% of women, of decision makers in the media are women. Only 2.25% of all peace agreements are women. Only 18% of all politicians are women. Only, I don't know, actually representation at the corporate CEO level, but like handful in one hand are women. And if we are to change this reality, we cannot only change it being from the civil society and from the social structure. We've got to change the politics, the corporate, the government, the media, and the civil society. We've got to take over all, not take over, I don't believe if women rule the world, uh, we will be a better place. I don't think so. I think if women and men lead the world, we'll be a good place. I actually will be scared if women lead the world. Uh, the one who hurt me the most were women, you know? <laughs> so it's not, but it's the equality of voices and of representation that's gonna make the world a better place. It's not we are better or worse, it's the equality. And it's the justice that makes the world a better place. So, um, as Rumi says, out beyond the worlds, and Rumi is a 13th century Sufi poet for those of you who don't know him, out beyond the worlds of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field. I shall meet you there. When the soul lies down in that field, there is no language, ideas, all of it becomes irrelevant. I just messed up the last two lines, but the point is, the only way we can actually make it a better way is if we meet in the field, where we put our ego on the side, and we put our hearts in the front. And that's the way, in, at least, that I am embracing, and I'm trying to learn. So I hope to see you in the field. Thank you very, very much.